161. Thank you so much for being here. Please give yourselves a round of applause for being out on a Tuesday in this miserably hot weather. Thank you for being here. My name is Emily. I co-produced this show not by myself, though. Blair is not here. She's out of town. She's usually up here with me. And we also have Amanda, who is in the back at the soundboard. Thank you, Amanda, for being here. And we have John over here taking video. So really a wonderful team. We have Steve here taking pictures. So I would like maybe Steve a round of applause for all the volunteers that make this show happen. They're really special. Thank you. Um, we don't really have too many announcements. We don't have any workshops coming up. I would like to let you know that this show doesn't happen if people don't send us stories. It's kind of like the founding principle and what really makes it go around. So if you get inspired and you want to write a story, you can send it in to GrownUpStoryTimeHouston at gmail.com, even if it's not done, or if you want to bounce some ideas off us. Like, we really do just like helping people write stories for this show, so you can send in pretty much literally anything, and we'll help you get it ready for the show. Um, and then next month, we'll have a story reading party, maybe at Double Trouble, if the weather is not so hot. We were doing it on the patio, but it was just too hot. Um, so we did it in a different location. But you can follow us on social media. It's at Grown Up Storytime on both Instagram and Facebook. And I kind of think maybe that's all I should tell you before we bring the host up. I'm normally not up here by myself, so I think it's okay. I think we can start. Okay, um, I'm going to bring your host up. Uh, please give a big round of applause for Ashley Hendricks. Give it up for yourselves and everybody that made a story time happy. Are you guys excited to hear these fun stories? Yeah! Okay, I'm excited too. I almost had to sit in the story. I tried to use the men's bathroom because the women's bathroom was full earlier. And then the man came in there. I was like, I'm getting out of this one. <laughs> I needed somebody to figure that out for me. Shout out to this bar. This bar is beautiful. Isn't it nice in here? I feel like I need to know at least three Elvis songs to be in here. <laughs> All right, we're going to get the show started. I'm excited. Um, the first story that we're going to hear is by Avenus. Kumar, and it will be read by Fred Linder. So everybody take your left hand and your right hand and show some love right now for Fred Linder, ladies and gentlemen. I was thinking about you all the whole time. The first nerd at Nerd Night, a lawyer. He taught me the McDonald's coffee lawsuit inspired Texas lawmakers to write the cruelest medical laws in the country. The second nerd, a musician. He taught me a cheat code for piano. If you press only the elevated black keys, it sounds good enough where people would think you know how to play. And the final nerd, a talented photography teacher. She taught me, before cameras, humanity could never capture memories, and that this brilliant invention was the first to bring generations together across time, beyond death even. My parents' house caught fire before COVID. It didn't burn down. It burned up for hours. My sisters, mine, my parents' photographs, decades of albums, black and whites, negatives, destroyed. That funny one of me crying in the car seat right after I kicked the gear shift in the drive while my parents were outside emptying the trunk? Gone. That graphic one of my mom I definitely wasn't supposed to see, showing my sister being born, like, as she was being born, like, Front row seats in the splash zone at SeaWorld? <laughs> Gone. The blurry one of my dad, running up the hill to smack me because I was using all the film, taking pictures of him running up the hill to smack me because I was using all the film? Gone. Early life in these United States, family reunions, blizzards, road trips, people we'd never see again, either literally or as we did then. Unpacking the Xbox I won from Taco Bell. All gone. 
We won't remember what we forget, but without those photos, I'll probably forget what I remember. A treasured picture isn't perfect. It's real. It's candid. Maybe poorly lit, maybe quadruple chin, maybe grainy, red eye, slow, intentional, experimental. And the people in it might not even notice the camera because they're the ones doing a thing worth remembering. Like, when I first moved to Houston, I was so excited to live on my own in a new city. I was like Harry Bradshaw in the Chamber of Sex and the City Crits. <laughs> my first paycheck from my first big baby boy, baby job boy, paid for my first camera from b and in New York. A Canon T2i with a stock lens, perfect for me to explore my Houston, Houston city. Little sugar cookie puppy town. One Tuesday, I walked along Westheimer in West Alabama, cutting between neighborhoods and practicing photography on people, fences, clouds, a bird, segmented sunset sunray patterns everywhere. I framed, exposed, captured it all in a satisfying way, a perfect book. And then I'd feel this special feeling in my lungs. People told me later that was just the pollution. <laughs> but maybe it was the magic of beauty and exploration, too. Manila wouldn't let me in. I offered to take pictures of just the floor and not the art, which they thought was weird, but OK. They even let me take pictures of the bathroom. It's nice. Then I wound up at a lesbian bar, a pool hall on Westheimer. No, not Slip Willies, not Mary's. Shut up, let me think. Chances. Chances. R.I.P. It was a weird time. Back then, conservatives and liberals thought it was pretty gay to be a lesbian. <laughs> so, a wide-eyed greenhorn waltzing in with a clunky DSLR taking photographs in a same-sex sanctuary definitely raised eyebrows. Don't worry, I'm not going to out anyone, I'm just practicing. The bouncers murmured and confirmed and said, yes, but please, use discretion. So I snapped dimly lit, technically terrible, cute as hell, intentionally blurry photos of lovers in a pool hall enjoying each other's company. I uh, started to feel something down there. It was a powerful, uncontrollable feeling. <laughs> Turns out I had to pee. I deleted the photos in good faith, crossed the street, Snapped a pic where 90% was dark blue sky with a little yellow tattoo parlor in the bottom right hand corner. Then I approached the building and went on a mystical journey to your nation, nation. I dry farted too. <laughs> when I stepped onto the sidewalk, the owner came out and said the next time I did that, he would shoot me. These terms were acceptable, so I moved on. Finally, 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 I skipped north on wall, twirling my camera around my neck like a sober maniac high on life holding a squishy teddy bite. Oh, what's this? Two elephants going at it? Weird, but picture perfect. I shot it and went inside the elephant sex dive bar. Empty downstairs, so I got a drink upstairs. Probably a beer. Cheers. When I turned around with my margarita, there were nine or 10 people in the room watching someone on stage. He spoke quietly into the microphone, like a little cinnamon dove. Everyone heard the wavy nervousness in his voice as he read aloud a story that I guess someone else had written. A spotlight shone above him, lit, shot the spotlight from above lit him harshly on the multi stage. Tremors in his hands. The paper shook. It looked like low shutter speed IRL. Definitely a grainy performance. Nothing polished about it, but it was candid. It was real, slow, intentional, experimental, 
and the group hung on to his every word. It was the most endearing thing I'd never expected to stumble upon. And you want to know how I know it was special? Because I forgot to take a picture. <laughs> Those 10 people watching, that nervous speaker on stage, Emily, Blair, and all of you of eight sugar kids who had just started Grown Up Story Time, they were our ancestors. All of us here are now their babies, including themselves. And I so wish I had a photograph of my point of view that night to connect all of us from now with us from then. Three by five, mostly black. The silhouette at the back of my head in the center. To the left, distant, fuzzy. Speckled silhouettes of the founders. And to the right, the heart of the picture. A little storytelling campfire captivating a small tribe, self-sufficient and entertainment, quietly arting all over the place on a Tuesday. But maybe it's okay, because you never know whose house will burn out the flames next. Maybe us hearing this now, imagining what the original series looked like as part of the next generation, is enough. Maybe in the absence of a real photograph, this story could be the picture from then. It is about a thousand words after all. A photographer walks into a bar, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, written by Avalon, Kumar, and read by Fred. Did you guys enjoy that? We got some more amazing stories. We want to keep the show rolling. The next story is called One Foot in Front of the Other, written by Emily and read by Laura McGee. Ladies and gentlemen. significant accomplishments in our lives. We learn to stand on what we think is shaky ground when really we're just going through the process of learning how to keep our balance, become stronger and more confident. Then, after many failed attempts, we finally take that first step and a second, yet we continue to stumble, fall, and possibly even hurt ourselves again and again and again. But then we learn to walk with solid footing. We gain independence, putting one foot in front of the other, persevering, growing, getting stronger, you could use learning how to walk as an analogy for most of the things we do in life. We take a step towards something knowing there may be risks, that there are risks, and we're willing to accept that, even though our efforts may result, result in disappointment, failure, <laughs> like that, pain, or self-fulfillment, love, success, and peace. This is a story of the steps I took towards my biological father, feet. It begins as a classic tale, really. Guy from out of town in the restaurant, I apologize, and he sees a woman, a waitress, and he's entranced by her, the vixen that she was. 
tricky thing that was that he was already married and she, a single mother of four. Fast forward a year or so, and here comes number five. Yeah, yeah, surprise, it's me. The last time I saw him, he, I was three years old, riding in his 70s Ford pickup truck, staring at a mallard mounted to the dashboard. I won't dive too deep into my life being the youngest of five with a single parent, though my mother worked extremely hard, we were poor. She did the best she could and loved us the best way she knew how, but her struggles were ours. Life was hard. I always wondered what happened to he. All I knew was that he was my father and had an, another life with a wife and a daughter. I can remember being eight years old and asking my mom, why don't we ask him for help? Because God knows we needed it. Of course, it was more than just that for me. I. It would mean that this elusive man, my father, actually cared and loved me. It would, he wanted to take care of me. Pride and a broken heart kept my mother from contacting him. Curiosity and the yearning for stability and his love always kept him on the forefront of my mind. By the time I was 14, we had lived in at least 18 different places. At that point, it was just my brother and I living together. My mom had gotten married and moved about 45 minutes away. She asked if I wanted to go with her. Why would I want to uproot my life to start again at some place new where she's creating a new life for herself? She was pretty absent and I am pretty much raised myself, so I decided to stay where I was. My longing and curiosity for Pete, a father, had grown more and more over the years. My mom had always kept his number, and I found it one day and wrote it in my diary. I made a few attempts to reach him in my teenage years, careful to avoid his family as to not cause them any harm. My attempts were met with pitiful rejection. Picture this. It's raining. I was 15 years old, driving home from school and pulled over on the side of the road. I got out of my car and walked to the phone booth to call him. I was nervous and scared, but desperately just seeking, wanting, needing someone to make me feel safe and taken care of. I wanted my dad. So I slid the coins in the coin box and dialed his number. He answered and enthusiastically said, hello. My voice trembled and I said, uh, hi, it's uh, Emily. He stayed quiet for a bit. And even to this day, I can feel the energy change at that moment on the call. He then said, I, I'm sorry. And I asked for what? He said, I can't and hung up. 
I stood there with a hand set to my ear in a state of shock and then placed it back on the switch and began to sob. Tears covered my face while the rain covered the phone booth. That wasn't the first time I felt that way as I had been met with similar, similar responses from him previously and sadly, this wouldn't be the last. All of the steps I had taken towards Pete had failed. I finally realized that these were steps I could no longer afford to risk taking. My father rejected me, so I had to move on. Unfortunately, that curiosity never left. Fast forward to my 30s. I was thinking about having a baby and wanted to know what the medical history was on Pete's side what might be in store for me and possibly my child. So I sent a message on Facebook to ask. There was truth and sincerity in wanting to know, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't just another attempt to connect with him. It failed. No response. I had fallen down once again. A few years later, I looked at his Facebook page and there was a post from his wife stating that he had passed away. I felt more relief than sadness. Finally, finally, the door was closed and I could put it behind me. I would no longer give him occupancy in mind or heart. Okay, but, but I still wanted an answer. Like, what was his family's medical history? Uh, where did they descend from? What were his people like? So I went to the experts. Ancestry DNA. I was curious to know more about my mom's family history, so it worked out both ways. A few weeks later, I got an email saying I had matched with a first cousin on my paternal side. With solid footing, I took a step forward and messaged him. He was cautious, yet kind and respectful. Undenounced to me, he was messaging his mom, my aunt, while he and I were talking about the family details. He revealed that he told his mom about me, and she wanted to know if I'd be open to communicating with her. I take another step. We correspond via email, incorporating my other aunt into the conversation. I was honest about everything. My experiences with him and whatever else I knew they were receptive, curious, kind, and dare I say, welcoming? I didn't know how to navigate this situation, nor did I expect anything, but I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, careful not to lose my balance. Entering stage left is my sister, half-sister, and that throws me for a loop. I grew up feeling like I needed to protect her and from, you know, from knowing about me because I didn't want anyone else to, to hurt like that. She grew up an only child, always wanting a sister and never knowing I was there the whole time. Tricky twist of fate. I began communicating with my aunts and sister, feeling as though I was in a liminal space, caught between this ever-present fear of rejection and a warmed, welcomed curiosity. Still, 
putting one foot in front of the other, I move forward. Over time, I found myself stepping out of the car to meet my sister, then stepping out of the car to, uh, excuse me, and stepping out of an elevator to meet one of my aunts, and then finally stepping into the open arms of my other aunt in a hotel parking lot, there was no more fear. I was able to walk towards them with confidence and love that was reciprocated. It was a brave endeavor and I found nurture starting to bloom and an unknown nature starting to surface. We lose footing many times in our lives. There are times when we're forced to take another path or take a seat and reassess the situation. There are also times when we give up completely or take five steps back and become paralyzed in fear. But don't forget, we were essentially babies when we learned how to walk putting one foot in front of the other, falling, getting back up, and trying again. Moving forward in one direction or another. Persevering, getting stronger, and growing. Thank you. Give it up one more time, ladies and gentlemen, for Laura McGee. Once again, that was one foot in front of the other, written by Emily. Are you guys enjoying the stories? Thank you. I appreciate you. I, I see you coming up here. You came quick. Give it up for the mic fixer, the mic stand fixer. He fixes microphones, makes a good Henny and Coke. He's good. All right, you guys, if you guys have a... um. A program. If you turn on the back, if there is an email that shows where you can submit your stories. We love to hear the stories. Some of the stories are funny, some are thought the back, and some might make it tear up. Just a little bit, but we want to hear more stories. So make sure you guys are submitting. And, and, yeah, use it as therapy. Let somebody read your story out loud. All right? I'm going to send them the stories. It's going to be crazy. Y'all going to know it's my story. I'm going to send them the stories. Use it as therapy. Let somebody read your story. Eyes big. I'm the captain now. I'm going to send them the stories. The next story is called Jungle Cat, and it is written by Claire McQuanis, and it will be read by John McDonough. Please leave it up for John Cat, and it is written by Claire McQuanis, and it will be read by John Dunn. Please give it up for John Dunn, everyone. Jungle Cat <laughs> was my neighbor, and I feel honored to have shared an adjoining wall with her. This majestic woman owned one of the most beautifully crafted set of fingernails that I had ever had the privilege of witnessing in person. I mean, they were a fiery rouge hue and fine, delicately to a point at the tips. Regardless of the weather, I had only seen her in pants once in the six years that uh, I had known her, although I must add that she was an extremely reclusive creature, so it was not often that I had a glimpse of her at all. Our preferred choice was a, uh, a wardrobe was a long and loose-fitting summer frock in a tropical floral pattern, the, the sort of thing that my friends at Wendita wore regularly and are sometimes referred to as cat pants. Uh, I really didn't think she looked damn good in them as well. With all of that said, Jungle Cat's appearance wasn't the most fascinating uh, fascinating aspect of her persona. Uh, 
Here's where the story begins. There was a time many years ago when she and I were both plagued by a honeybee infestation in our shared brick firewall. You could hear those bees actively buzzing away behind the plaster, almost vibrating the entire wall. Concerned with my own house cat safety, I decided that it was imperative that we hire a bee rope relocator to humanly, humanely extract the hive and move it to a better long-term living situation. Yeah. The friendly gentleman who I hired for the project wore Birkenstocks and running shorts for the 10-foot climb up the ladder to where the entry tunnel of the hive was located. Uh, from there, he was able to determine that the hive was stationed kind of directly behind Jungle Cat's built-in office bookcases. Uh, this was the first time I was ever allowed access to her territory. I was just oozing with curiosity. And what lay before me would absolutely surpass my wildest fantasies. So I took the first few steps of my journey into her domain, and I almost smacked straight into a mirrored wall. <laughs> Stunned and disoriented, I realized that the wall reflected a rainforest themed mural painted entirely across one side of the living room. I followed the leopard printed carpet into a leopard pool, which was the sunken living area. I mean, all the furniture there was upholstered in a matching leopard print, as well as the stairs leading up to the open second floor, which overlooked this incredible seating view. Hey. Gazing over her living lair, I faced a majestic, uh, I faced a majestic fireplace with a mirrored facade from floor to ceiling. The hanging plants draped over all of it at varying levels and were reflected in the mirrored coffee table and end tables, and tribal sculptures, and spears, masks, and many other cultural works of art were decorated every inch of free space. I was midway up the leopard staircase when I was startled by a life-sized wooden sculpture of a Polynesian beat god and missed the next few stairs completely. The wildcat carpet finally ended at the kitchen entryway, but the discoveries did not. Peering inside revealed that every wall and backsplash was painted in a bright metallic gold. The tiled floor and counter were obsidian black, and once more, the kitchen dining table had a mirrored top reflecting its surroundings. And we could get some honey out of all this. I heard a gravelly voice casually occur to me, and I just about sprang onto the wooden chandelier. We didn't um, get any honey, that is. But the bees were safely transported to a more appropriate and pleasant living quarters. It had been years since my journey into her world, yet every now and then on warm summer nights I could hear a singing voice faintly drifting through our firewall and open windows. Nestled comfortably in my bed with my own small female, feline child, I would whisper gently, Do you hear that, my love? Those are the mysterious songs of the jungle cat. It has now been years since the times of Jungle cats, nightly serenades, years since I shared a wall with her. We shared a fondness for one another in a distant yet present way, you know, the way that only big cats can. Over the years, she began to trust me more and more until one day, after casually greeting me at our conjoined entryway, caftan on and ruby nails intact, she placed a leopard print key in my drab, unpolished hand. I thought you should have this just in case, she purred. I nodded, and no other words needed to be spoken between us. I kept the key on my keychain for years after I moved away from the Montrose jungle and into a drier climate. I still keep her number in my phone. I don't know what ever happened to the jungle cat, but during the plague or you know, thereafter, I, and I'm unsure if I ever want to. I knew she was aging and had become even more reclusive in the last year that I lived next door to her. Her frequent coughing fits interrupted our nights rather than her soothing singing voice gently brushing by our ears. In the mornings, I would check for flies rather than bees passing between our walls. It, then an eruption of coughing would break the silence and I'd know the time for flies was not yet upon us. I, um, I disposed of the key she'd given me after I moved away. 
though she never asked me to return it to her. It didn't feel right for me to have access to her domain any longer. Though now, 11 years after my first encounter with the jungle cat, <laughs> I have nothing to remember her by. But this tale and some old memories we share locked away within the human caverns of my mind. Jungle Cat, written by Claire McQuanis and read by John Dunn, once again. The next story you're going to hear is called Near and Far, and it is written by Amanda Shee, and it will be read by Abina Kumar. As a child, my mom drove me nuts. She criticizes my posture in public. She bans me from the school band because brass is too brazen and allows zero time for friends because not one of them can be trusted. You're pushing me away, Mom. I yell when I've had enough. I'll show her. <laughs> I slouch in class while taking notes. I listen to Lil Wayne and Nas while doing my homework. I play Texas Hold'em with the boys, with violence after training for math and science competitions. Between her tight grip, my brother's temper, I want to be far, far away from my family. At times I wish for a different family, a whole one, like the ones my classmates, like the ones my classmates have, with two living parents. and family trips, camping, snowboarding, big family gatherings for the holidays, movie nights, the works. When the time comes, I run. I run away to college, all the way in Houston, a mere 30 minute drive away. My mom does not drive, so it is kind of a big deal. I go to parties, Make friends with abandon, dance on tables, hang around campfires, singing and drinking. I do also attend class, and then I meet someone. He flirts, I flirt. I think I like you, I say. And thus begins my First love. One day, after missing about five to twenty of my mom's back-to-back -back calls, she bursts into my dorm. This tiny lady, who does not drive but somehow made it here, is livid. Amanda, I see your phone bill. Who are you texting? My mom shouts in Cantonese, waving four pages of my T-Mobile phone bill in my face. First I deny, and then I tell her. She fumes. The black boyfriend! <laughs> and then she says some extremely profanely Racist things that 
I cannot put into writing or make someone else sing. <laughs> My mom and I disowned each other for a couple of years. His adopted family welcomes me in. They are a, a beautiful family. Cousins, family, friends, significant others, we all pile into mom and dad's house nearly every weekend. We watch movies and play video games late into the night. For Thanksgiving, we had turkey, green bean casserole, pie, and also plantains. I drink it all in. I feel full. With his own family, there are holes. His mom is around, but never close. I hear shame in the whispers about his missing father. And with him, the relationship curdles after I stay way, way past the expiration date. I move on, making a new home with two new friends at 808 Hawthorne in Montrose. I lose myself in great conversations, hang out late nights, host house parties, and I work. I have some feelings, but nothing serious. And then I meet someone. Are you single? I ask. And thus begins my second love. Oh God. This time I tell my mom voluntarily. This time she says this racist thing that is still racist, but at least not profane. For color, I'll share. Oh, hmm. They're better at math than Chinese people, you know. <laughs> Indian people. Seriously, they are better at like holding money and stuff. I swear that I do not answer. <laughs> We do not disown each other this time. She's kind of into him. An engineer and a physician? It's her dream. His family welcomes me in. Also a big, beautiful family. We go snowboarding. We play Pictionary with cousins, aunties, and uncles. So for Thanksgiving, we have turkey, sweet potato, creamed corn, and also chai from scratch. Christmas, we gather around the tree and unwrap presents. It's snowing outside. There's hot chocolate. I feel full. The generation before us slips in and out of Hindi, Punjabi, and English. In the glow of candles alight for Diwali, I see flickers of pain. In his mother's relationship with her mother, I see shadows of my mom and me. His grandmother is prescriptive and biting. His mother holds her own, but shrinks inward from time to time. Our any families home? Seasons change, and again, it's past my time to go. I cried to his father on the phone. Thank you for welcoming me into the family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I must go. And then I go home. I go home and I really look at my mom. After all this distance and becoming a part of other families, after finding pain in families I imagined to be home, 
And thus begins my third book. I turn back to you, Mom, my heart, my truth, my first. With distance, you come into focus. I see now all the manifestations of your anxieties, your fears. The, the world is hard on you. Softer, on me. You, you keep everyone at a distance. I ask you why, and so you tell me. You are the youngest sister, Amui, like me. Your father flees as your country self immolates. The Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward, just decades of Mao tearing families apart, member by member. You leave your home, the first of three sisters, for the chances to bring your family out of the uncertainty. You do not find a home here. The tremors of racial tension from between the fault lines of the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles shake you all the way in Chicago's Chinatown as your friends and neighbors are held at gunpoint and mugged. You do not mean to pose me like a doll to fit your vision of your daughter. Instead, you were pushing down the pain of your own life to make a home for my brother and me. You box yourself and us in a case to keep us safe. You do all this alone. You held me too near. I wasn't ready, but now I see. My family? We play card games, such as Dodai or in English, Big Two. We watch Chinese soap operas. We bicker whenever you cut my hair. When I want it long, you cut it short. And when I want it short, you leave it too long. Amanda, are you the gay? <laughs> you spiral. I do not answer. <laughs> For Thanksgiving, I go to Sulap City and pick up a whole roasted duck for our centerpiece poultry. We have mooncakes for the mid-autumn celebration and long noodles for Lunar New Year. I tell you once, I love you. And you bounce back. Oh, now you know. <laughs> we are small and beautiful. For much of my life, I fight to live for me and not for you. Now I wonder, what if I could? What if, like in X-Men, your mind and my mind could look? The things I would show you, I would take you to Flushing, New York, and share with you the fresh-themed chong fun from Joe's Steam Rice Roll. I would revisit your childhood home in China, even though the places are now unmade by the hands of time. I would take you to my favorite parks in Houston and have you teach me all about the flora. I would unclench your fist and show you friends from all different walks of life that make my life so rich. I would untangle your fears and distrust from you. I am having these tender thoughts about how much I love you and how much I want to be near you after all of my care and constructing a life just far enough from you. And then I hear from a distance, Ah, we are! My mom's voice yanks me back into my physical reality of being the 99 Ranch in Sugar Land. <laughs> the smells of raw meat, dried mopping fluid from the morning, and pork dumplings dipped in black vinegar for sampling. 
that jostle one another in my nostrils. The hum of the fluorescent tube lights, the resonant tones of Hua Chinese, Cantonese, Spanish, Vietnamese, and English clash with the K-pop track playing on the market speakers. A catfish glances at me through a foggy handprint smeared on the glass of the display case, boxing her in until her untimely death. Her mouth in a pout, whiskers drooping in stage resignation. Just one second later, I hear, ah, we are again. I shrug at the fish. No human bats an eye at this very public yell. It's just another Saturday afternoon at the 99 Ranch. I know where to find my mom, even with her voice bouncing around the aisles. There she is, tiny and vivacious, her aura radiating out of her in the medicinal herb aisle. This is her jam. This is her sport. She's on a hunt. She needs an assist to find the best bag of dried hawthorn berries at the best price. No dried berry unturned, no price unchecked. I stand there for what feels like 20 minutes, nodding while prodding the bags with her, pretending to see the difference, saying with uncertainty that each bag looks good and fresh, only for her to put the bags back and take several more off the shelf to compare. I feel steam rising out of the pores of my scalp as my tender thoughts evaporate. <laughs> ah, yes. You still do drive me nuts. Thank you. Once again, that was Near and Far, written by Amanda She read by Abhin Kumar. Yes. I am enjoying all of these stories. Make sure you guys go on social media, tell everyone where you are, where they ought to be. Tell them that you're having a good time so that we can keep this going. The Facebook and Instagram is at Growing Up Storytime. Please and feel free to take pictures um, and tag us in it. So that way people can keep going and get excited about this. I'm, as much as I'm enjoying the stories, I'm enjoying the storytellers. You guys are good. After the second page, I'd have been reading my fingers. Stutter. You guys are good. You're keeping me entertained. With that being said, we're going to go into the next story. We're almost at the end, but we're going to still have a good time. This next one is called My Last Caffeine Addiction. It is written by Emily Hines, and it will be read by Jose Pineda. Today, I received proof that my husband still cares for me. I should say further proof, not that I needed it, because you know, we spend every day together considering one another's wants and needs, what the best way to move forward is in our lives together. Because we go to bed at night together, and we wake up together, and we say I love you, and we kiss each other a lot. But still, it's nice to be reminded. Here's what happened. We both work from home. I went to the kitchen to eat a couple squares of dark chocolate, which is my last caffeine addiction. I read that it's actually good for me, so I am not going to kick it. I take the chocolate bar out of the container we keep them in, which has a good seal, and that's important, so remember it for later. I break off a couple squares. I leave the rest of the bar on the counter, boil open, because you already know I'm gonna go back to get some more in a bit. I just have to wander over to my computer to look at a few things while I eat the first squares. A while later, I go back to the kitchen for round two. 
and my finger brushes the bar. The chocolate appears to move and scuttle away, but what actually happened is that a cockroach, a big one, was sitting on the bar of chocolate, and these two things are the same color. So I didn't notice, and when I break off a square, I startled the fucking cockroach sitting on it, and it ran away into the dishwasher. I screamed. Not a long, blood-curdling scream, just a quick, I accidentally touched the large cockroach that was sitting on my chocolate bar that I was about to eat scream. I immediately heard my husband, who was off in the other room, yell, Are you okay? Then a mere seconds later, he was in the same room as me. I immediately felt better. I would not have to face this demon alone. My husband arrived on the scene to help me. Me. I recently learned about competence porn, and I think this for sure qualifies. Was I okay? Yes. Did I need assistance? Need might be a strong word, but I was glad he was there, so we'll go with yes. We could now see the roach was hiding on top of the dishwasher, but underneath the counter, an impossible space for human hands to reach. Joe smashed the creature with a broom, and we thought we were successful. But it turns out the cockroach was actually just plain dead. Because Joe tried to sweep, sweep him up, scoop him up with, paper, with a paper towel, and the cockroach revived and scuttled deeper into the recesses of the counter beyond the dishwasher beyond our grasp. <laughs> the rest of the chocolate bar was thrown away. Very sad. <laughs> I think the unopened chocolate that's in the container with the sealed lid is safe. Did y'all know that cockroaches like chocolate? I did not. Did y'all know that cockroaches can play dead? I did not. Anyways, that was my reminder for today that my husband cares about me. Yes, sir. Great job. Once again, that was my last caffeine addiction written by Emily Hines and read by Jose Pinetta. That's a standing ovation right there, Jose. I think it was the Maxwell Afro. <laughs> this last story is called Steve, and it is written by Adriana, and it will be read by Kirsten Dorier. Ladies and gentlemen, Kirsten. was named Cynthia. I always looked forward to my appointments with her. Cynthia and I would catch up and laugh the entire appointment, each of us remembering details we had shared in prior appointments. She always remembered how I liked my waxes done. It was intimate in more ways than one. I was honestly a bit heartbroken when she informed me that she was moving to Miami. She gave me a little gift bag during our last appointment and referred me to a different esthetician in the same business here in Houston. My relationship with the new esthetician didn't have much of a chance to develop since the building they were housed in burned down, but that's a story for another day. I uh, let the hedges grow a bit because having to go back to square one and finding a new waxer I trusted felt emotionally taxing. My anxiety mixed with ADHD made it much easier to avoid the whole search for about a month until my hedges got out of control. I'm not sure how other people go about finding a waxer, but I went to Uncle Google to find a new spa that I felt comfortable going to. 
Do other people ask friends who they allow to wax their downstairs bits? Are there waxers that provide wax services to large networks of people who all know each other? <laughs> Do the six degrees of separation apply to people who wax their nether regions? It's always difficult to make decisions like this, especially if the services I am paying for require the person to be all up in my business. I knew I would never be able to replace Cynthia, but I picked a spa that seemed to have decent reviews and crossed my fingers that it would be a good match. Upon entering the little house that this waxing place was located in, I was immediately comforted by all of the various plants, windows, and cozy pillows in the waiting room. There's something about people being able to keep plants alive that automatically makes me trust them. In my mind, I think, oh, you can ensure a plant has what it needs to survive? I can maybe trust you with my hedges. <laughs> the waxer I had booked my appointment with uh, came out and was warm and welcoming. She described what she was going to do and asked me for my preferences. I felt cared for and could sense my anxiety lessen in an instant. As the appointment continued, she asked what I did for a living. I asked her where she was from. We talked about different places in Houston that had good planters. The tension in my shoulders melted and I shared how I was working with her because I could no longer see Cynthia. I was vulnerable in more ways than one. I felt that this could be the start of a beautiful waxing friendship. We were vibing. We were making amazing small talk while I scrolled my phone. My waxer then asked, oh, is that your husband? As she pointed to my phone lock screen. I was horrified for two reasons. Number one, I had never once mentioned being partnered or married. Not every femme-presenting person of a certain age has a husband, ma'am. <laughs> also, do people just have photos of their boo things on their phone lock screen? That feels strange to me, unless you have a disorder where you can't remember faces or something. <laughs> I have similar feelings about people who have portrait tattoos of their dead grandmothers on their bodies. Like, why? And Number two, how the actual fuck does someone not recognize Steve fucking Bouchine? <laughs> how could I have been so wrong about this person? I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. How dare you? I learned something from this, I think, as I told her. No, that's just a friend. <laughs> I feel like I should explain, but I also believe I shouldn't have to. Steve Buscemi is a national treasure. This is an objective fact. I grew up watching him and hearing his voice in so many movies and shows. I know parasocial relationships are often seen in a negative light, with many noting the ways in which they can potentially be unhealthy and obsessive. I have never been obsessive, exactly. He has simply always come across as a non-problematic man who is authentically himself, even if he has played some unhinged characters. I once shared this information with a boyfriend I had who was 100% in support of my love for Steve. He understood and never made me feel weird about it. Once, he and I walked to the apartment we shared nearby after a night of one too many drinks at Points and Girl and Montrose. <laughs> the moon was full and beautiful that night and somehow sparked the question, do you ever wonder if Steve Buscemi is something? Also looking up at that same moon in that same moment. I could not tell you what led to this specific question, drunken specific thought, but it is a phrase that I still 
say every so often to this day. <laughs> it then only made sense that I saved photos from a photo shoot Steve Buscemi did to model an array of boldly printed jackets from Kids Spring 2022 collection. The photos are perfection, and I had to save one as my phone lock screen. It brings me joy almost every time I see it. Maybe this is one of the ways that I manage my mental illnesses. Finding the people and the things that bring me joy. I try to hold on to the tiny bits of joy because my brain thinks too fucking much and can be a noisy place to exist in. Making so many decisions on the day-to-day -day is difficult. Being a human living in a capitalist hellscape that doesn't care about us is fucking difficult. Why pretend it isn't? And yes, perhaps it is silly that I continue to feel a deep emotional connection with an actor who doesn't even know that I exist. But at this point, I have committed to the bit and I can't change the photo now. <laughs> And that was Steve, written by Adriana and read by Kirsten Dorian. This has been Grown Up Storytime. I am your host, Ashley Henderson. Big shout out to Blair. Shout out to Emily. Shout out to Amanda for creating such a fun and safe space. Show some love for those ladies. Make sure you guys go on your social media, follow us on Facebook and IG at Grown Up Story Time. And most importantly, submit your stories at Grown Up Story Time Houston at gmail.com. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. Make it home safe. It's been a great night. <laughs>